Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Ones Ready podcast. I mess it up as usual. Uh, you've got Trent, Aaron, and I, and then we have Dr. Preston Klein. Appreciate you joining us, sir. And I promise I won't call you sir. That was by accident. That's oh, yeah. force That's, of habit. You have done the weirdest thing. You've done like three things that you've never, I've never seen you do at all in the intro of this one. Yeah. I, uh, I'm still working off coffee here. You're so, doing great, buddy. <laughs> All right, Preston, you are part of the Mission Critical Team Institute, which um, I'm sure you probably have a better better term for it. But I see you guys as a as a think tank uh, specifically for soft, because really, that's how we kind of were introduced is is through our, our good friend Trey Free. Um, it, so kind of get us into the background of, of how you found founded, really, the Mission Critical uh, Team Institute. And then we'll start going from there about uh, some of the things that you've talked about that I've seen you talk about in terms of NCOs and, and special operations. No worries. So uh, if you go back, if you go back to 2008 or so, I was at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania helping to run the leadership program office. I was the program director for what's called the Venture Program. So I led all their wilderness expeditions around the world. So Kilimanjaro and Antarctica and all that stuff. Um, a lot of my students were coming out of special operations or tactical law enforcement or professional sports. And I noticed me, my background is as a wilderness guide. I've led expeditions on all seven continents. And so I started to find all these things in common with, with folks that were used to being cold, wet, tired, and hungry under con different conditions than me. And my research focus has always been how do people learn how to navigate uncertainty, especially extreme uncertainty, like 300 seconds or less, where criticality and urgency are both coming into play. And so I got this idea that I would just go and sort of view some of these teams. So I got access to some of the special mission units, uh, the training facilities. And I'm in the shoot house, as for many of you people who are listening will know what a shoot house is, right? And so uh, they're, they're practicing hostage rescue, and I'm watching this four-man team enter the room, clear with live fire. My first experience with live fire, I'm a I'm a, you know, I'm a wilderness guy. I'm, I'm a bohemian. I'm a hippie. I'm not a, I'm not a military guy. So this is all new to me. I was, and I look like a six foot tall gopher and body armor and ear pro and eye pro and just look like one of those things, not like the other. Right. And next to me, this is 2008, right? This is legal biker gang days. So next to me is this eight foot tall Neanderthal with full sleeve tattoos, huge beard, spit and chew into a Red Bull cup, a whole bit. Right. And he's mentioned a few times that he wishes I would leave soon. So our relationship's still sort of evolving, you know what I mean? And so everyone around it and these instructors, right? All these instructors are all NCOs. There's not an officer to be seen. I'm invited in by the NCOs. And the reason they care is because this is the first post 9-11 generation coming back to the schoolhouses to sort of fix some of the mistakes that were made by the preceding generation. So that's why the, I'm there. And so these four man team comes in and clears and then the, the house manager from down below yells clear and he points up at his Neanderthal and he goes feedback for number one man. And he like, I don't know if I can swear on this. Can I swear on this? Yes, you can. You can yeah. swear. And he, he points at this kid basically and said, hey, douchebag, you suck, suck less. And I'm there with like a notepad and a card getting ready to write down like the wisdom of the ages, right? Or how people, and I'm like, we are so fucked. Like we are that hard doc. You just got to suck less. You're going to have yeah. to trust me on this one. You yeah. know how many times I just stopped sucking and everything went fine every time. So what happened <laughs> was, time. right? So what happened was it's called the default mode network. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's called the tacit knowledge transfer problem. We can talk about the default mode network later. The tacit knowledge transfer problem. And the problem is, you know how to ride a bike, but you can't teach it to me. So you guys in your professions, whether it be PJ or combat control or other things, you know what right looks and feels like, but you can't always explain to someone else. So what MCTI does is we are an applied research, meaning we're solving for Monday. We're not 20 years out. We're Monday problems. And we're an educational. So we're trying to work with through collaborative inquiry. So we're partnering with all of our members around the 5i community, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, UK, and U.S., we're trying to figure out a better language so that you, when you move from becoming an operator to instructor, remember just because you could do a thing doesn't mean you can teach a thing. So once you become an instructor, our job is to help you get the right language to accelerate that person's ability to do their job. And just to close here to put a fine point so the audience fully understands, this July, a lot of residents in surgery around the country are going to leave the classroom and pick up a scalpel for the first time. 
and your loved one's health is highly dependent on that is that attending physician being able to articulate what right feels like and looks like. So I'll pause there. <laughs> well, well, that as well as they are sure used to being uh, sleep deprived. Yeah. Because what we do to the to the the surgeon community. Oh my God. Through they're going through school is insane. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know the two <laughs> most studied groups. Um, for sleep deprivation are pilots and surgeons, and the two most non-compliant groups are pilots and surgeons. <laughs> that makes yeah, that seems about right. I mean, like if, if you look at the military population, I can't believe that we don't rank on that list. I, I thought we would have to be number one with a, a dang bullet. It, uh, just, they don't uh, they don't let you they don't let us see the data. Oh well, that would be why. Yeah, I mean, you look at every every E two to E six in the world right now is subsisting off of four hundred milligrams of caffeine in a bucked up energy drink with a Zen in their lip at eight o'clock in the morning, like after PT, and like I'm gonna go download like three hundred milligrams of pre workout and go to the gym after this. And people are like, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "No, this is just that's just normal. my morning normal thing, yeah. man." Yeah. Like. This is how yeah. I suck less. They told me to suck less. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So Pay attention and suck less. Yeah. Somebody, Unfortunately, we impact. now know like the long term impact on that. Not awesome. Not Sub awesome. Good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Operator syndrome and, and the like. But yeah. <laughs> the um, now you call that tacit knowledge. That's right. So ta so tacit knowledge is is your knowledge of experience as opposed to theoretical knowledge, which is what you can learn. Okay. And and how am I? Is that something that I am naturally applying through through repetition after repetition after repetition, or is that like, yep, it's it's oh. how if I were if you were to get fully kitted up with all your kit, right, and I were to walk up to you and say, why do you put that piece there? You probably don't have a good answer, but there is a good answer. It's because you've done it four thousand times, and you're like, this is the right way to do it. So there's a lot of that that translates into the the mindset of the older folks or the folks that have been doing it a long time that just 100%. say, well, well, that's the way we've always done it. Or that's right. It, that's, that's just the way I do it. And they cannot change. That's right. So, so how do we, with, with the uh, change in technology and, and how things are increasing and how, you know, SOPs and, and TTPs are, are I'm using acronyms again, yep, standing yep. operating procedures yep. and tactics, takes these procedures. I'm, yep. I'm saying it for the audience. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, how, how do we, how do we adapt appropriately? It's um so uh, I, without getting into names, right. There was a, a former, one of your brethren, brethren named Bubba. There's a lot of Bubba's, but there's one <laughs> specific Bubba. Right. And Bubba was, I was outside uh, at uh, one of the selections and I'm observing him uh, do a selection on um, a combat controller. And um, he's like, these guys all suck. They all suck. And I'm like, do they suck now? where you are or do they suck when you were 19 and he was like oh good point they actually are pretty good for when i was 19 in other words the problem isn't the changing thing the problem is, is that we lose a little bit of our humility a little bit of our curiosity a little bit of our kindness right and and this idea that it's our job to generate the to develop the next generation of, of kids and we, we got to do that with a little bit of empathy right like we all sucked at one point but we had we usually had some elder in our community that grabbed us by the scruff of the neck and says, come here, I'm going to show you how to do this. I mean, I don't know how many times we've seen this play out. You get these great team guys that come to, to where I'm at, to the training command yep. to be instructors. Yep. And I think it's just frustrating for them sometimes because they, they don't have the words to, to get the folks to where they need to be. There, there's yeah. a lot of things to unwrap here, right? There's the, the, the you forgot how much you sucked and then yep. your your version of of you going through the the processes in your in your memory is not necessarily accurate and then it's like then you forget like your new normal is like this stage of where you are in life right. and so when you see these these 18 year old kids come in and they're struggling to do whatever push-ups or or, right. or you know man makers and all these other things like you, it's frustrating because you want to be able to explain to them how they're messing everything up what they're doing wrong and how to make them better but instead you just say suck less. Right. Like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you be more like me? And I think it's just a frustration thing. We see this happen over and over again. And those same guys, though, by the time they leave the training command, a lot of the times, like we had one of these guys on just the other day, uh, Peaches did, you, you finally see the whole process. But it takes a long time to get someone there to explain yeah. to the students why they're doing what they're doing, why it's so important, and, and using the correct words to get them from A to B as quickly as possible uh, without just like 
you know, wrecking these these folks for no reason. Trenton, it's actually a little bit worse than that, actually. So okay. here's what happens, right? Is that you're this amazing operator. You've been out in the field for a while. You, the reason they're bringing you back to the schoolhouse, in some cases, not always, is because you're really good at what you do. So you have huge confidence because you have huge competence. Then you, they should put you in the schoolhouse, and now all of a sudden you're no longer competent, and you start to lose your confidence. You want it back. So, like, what are the tools in your toolkit? I know I'll beast these sons of bitches because that's it was harder in my day. So instead of teaching them, you're like, we'll just beat on them harder. And um, I see that play over and over and over again. And usually, what that means is that the true great candidates are like, I'm not, I'm not joining this sorority. I'm out of here. So you end up burning your pipeline. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough, and it's hard to take you know a 26 year old who just came off the the battlefield you know this happened yep. for years with our community and to be like hey man you don't know how to do this yeah he's like no i can do everything that's happening so like how what's the first step in 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 getting that person the instructor and in fixing the instructor getting the instructor to suck less uh, so, to, to help yeah. the next generation there's two answers to this so i'm gonna be controversial guys um the u.s air force and i have an ongoing um a really complicated relationship and it's complicated because the u.s air force unlike the other divisions are primarily a corporation they're primarily set up to buy and sell things they're not they're not bought to develop humans everybody else is sort of develops humans that's not really what the air force that's not their primary skill set and so what ends up happening is you have a lot of folks who for whatever reason are put in command of organizations who are human centered, think AVSOC, think Air Force Weapons School, in some cases, not always, I'm making generalizations here. And what they don't know is that the work that's required to make an instructor great is hard to see if you don't know what you're looking for. So they tend to, they tend to like dismiss things or get rid of things before they fully understand them. So that's, we're in, we're in arguments on a pretty regular basis about that. To answer your, so, so my, why you're I'm saying that is because you have to start with a leadership that understands the principles of human development and can back up the instructors going down this path. To answer your question directly, if I had one piece of advice for people that are going from operator to instructor, it's this. You have to break one habit. And the one habit is what got you here is when somebody asks you a question, you give the right answer immediately or you do the right thing immediately. The minute you become instructor, you have to flip that and ask the right question. So you don't, you can't give the answer. You have to give, you have to give a right question. So it's as easy as you ask me a question and I look at you and go, what I heard you say just now, your question is this, is that correct? And have you considered this and this? You just start with inquiry. And if you can just do that, you're 50% ahead of the game. Yeah, but that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really yeah, hard. Trump. Trent brings up a good point. The The benefit of that, though, is it terrifies the students. Yeah. Oh, my you know, God. You yeah. become a, a really good instructor and you start using that kind of Socratic method where you're asking questions and trying to get to the heart of the issue. Right. Like you're not just <laughs> answering this question. You're like, what are we really talking about here? Yeah. What are we, what are we doing? Uh, man, that that really does terrify. What does he the want students. me to say? It's great. Exactly. <laughs> what does he what want he, me to what say? What is he getting at? He seems like he's having a conversation with me because he cares. Nothing <laughs> makes a student. Yeah, more afraid than when my, they think you my care. grandmother had this technique where my grandmother adored me, helped raise me. And she would walk up to me when I would screw up. And she was like, Preston, you know, I'm, I think you're amazing. And I love you. Right. And I'm like, yeah, she's like, why would an amazing person do that? And I was like, oh, what side God. of the argument am I on right now? Wow. <laughs> First of pick, all, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going <laughs> to slave you right down. I was like, wait, how do I answer that question? I don't know. I'm 12. I don't even know why I did it. That's emotional terrorism. That's yeah. diabolical. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, though. You're right there, Preston. The, the Air Force is 100% all about the next shiny thing. Stuff. What, yeah. T things, things to help. And I, I think if we, if we get to a point where we can, as an Air Force, we recognize, obviously, there's small pockets within the Air Force that, sure, of course. you know, human, and, and that's the kind of... Yeah corporate message is, is people and people matter and all that kind of stuff, which is 100% true because humans are going to be the ones that change the tide of a battle or a yep. war or an engagement. But um, the technology is just a, a tool to help us get to that point. And, so, and as long as we continue to put that first, we're going to oh, screw yeah. up. Well, it's, it's, I, I would argue it's a little deeper for the air force because it, the folks that are getting managed and selected and raised in promotion 
are folks that are really good at collecting, managing, um, and taking care of stuff, right? And they like things pretty clean. And then you, you know, bearded rat bastard show up, right? You bunch of savages. And, and you're constantly sort of messy, necessarily messy. And so they come in and they feel like they need to clean things up. The problem is the Air Force is constantly risking making their unconventional forces conventional in order to fit into their little world. And we need to actually start developing Air Force leaders that understand they need a pocket of messy. They just have to protect the messy and keep the messy from getting out of hand. But they need to sort of leave it messy. Well, that's one of those things that we, we do have a hard time explaining to, to leadership sometimes is like, well, why <clears throat> why do you want to pick up this guy? Yeah. And we're like, well, because he's he's the right person. And they're right. like, why is he the right person? We're like, because, you know, like they're like, where's the data on this? Like, where, where's the data to show me that this person is going to be good on team? And sometimes the data supports your argument. And sometimes it's like the, the, the person is barely passing, yeah. you know, all the <clears throat> the qualifying factors. So, it, I mean, it, it's difficult. I think that's one of the problems. And also, I think it's the the. I don't want to invest in this many people knowing that 90% of them aren't going to make it, Yeah, you know, on the instructor side. I think that's a really difficult, like emotional thing to do it for is. a lot of our folks yeah. is like, I'm going to pour myself into all these folks and 90% of these folks are just going to like one day walk up to me after I've like, you know, tried to pour all my knowledge and, and goodness into them. Yeah. And they're going to look me in the eye and say, I quit. And they're yeah. going to leave. And that's, it's hard. Yeah. I, I will say this, that uh, MCTI, a lot of the work that we do out in the field, whether it be education or research, is giving the instructor cadre a, a valid scientific voice. And so so that when you are like, I don't like the shape of that guy's head, our job is to be like, that's not what you mean. What you mean is this. And so we help develop a language and then rigorous methodology so you can go to your boss and go, I know the psychs and the human performance folks and security folks are giving you this data. Here's a different looking but equally robust data to give our voice to you. And I think that balances things out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think we have the data. We just don't – yeah, like you said, we don't know how to explain it. You That's know, right. Like, we're like <clears> – yeah. we, we keep these folks up, and we want to see how they perform. We take away their food. We, we make them, you know, cold, wet, hungry. Yeah. But, like, it's just that – that I don't know. There's always, like, a gap between – yeah, the, the the nerds with the computers and us and 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 finding the right person. <laughs> nerds in the most loving way, <laughs> and the, yeah, in the most yeah, loving. Way. I was I was typing this down in the note as we were talking, but being an instructor is like it's super hard for dudes to accept because you quickly realize that it's a made game from the beginning. Like especially in the assessment selection sort of area, like becoming an instructor is a whole other thing. Like, yep. you know, good instructors are very few and far between, but you yep. realize as an instructor that really only two things ever happen, right? You realize you're completely irrelevant and the student that you completely like looked over, like that you didn't even think was going to make it just ends up absolutely smoking. It does great. And they really didn't need you all that much at, at all. Right. They had just made their mind up and they were on their path. And then the only other thing that you can do is pour your effort into the 91% of people that are going to fail. And you watch a whole bunch of people that you end up caring about just absolutely get smoked by the course because it's still a hard course. And so the second Yep. Sorry. Can, sorry I just re ahead. can I reframe that just a little bit? So one of the things that people sometimes instructor cadre, especially at the and the SOCOM level or JSOC level, forget is that you're that's that is one perspective. Another perspective to remember is that when when they come to your teams and they don't make it, they're not leaving the Air Force most of the time. They're going back somewhere. So if you broaden your spectrum and say, I'm gonna make everyone who comes to me better for the country. Right. It's a different framework than I'm going to develop everyone so that I succeed in selection. I think people can get more peace and 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 contentment knowing that they're making the U.S. Air Force and thereby the country better by developing every single human in front of comes in front of them. Sorry, yeah, your I, second point. No, that, that that was fantastic. I can't remember what good leader uh, said this. I can't. I don't want to misattribute it because it, I've got two people in my head that I thought I heard it for the first time, yeah. but they, they would tell us that like, Hey, you're the, you were basically the ambassador yeah. for hundreds of people that aren't going to make it. They're never going to be a, a PJ in my specific case or in the specific context, but they're never going to be a PJ. However, you might be the only PJ that they ever meet. So yeah. conduct yourself like a professional, have a good course, you know, treat people like humans, like they're going to go out. You get more recruiting from people that went to NDOC, that went to ANS, that went to try to do something and failed. And because those numbers are just much higher and yeah. then went to a different career field, like 
that's a thing in and of itself. So yeah, uh, yeah that's great input. The first time I heard it, it was it was a, a very shocking thing for me to hear because I never yeah. thought of it like that. Yeah. Can I tell you one quick funny PJ story before we move on? Totally unrelated. I would love it. <laughs> Absolutely. It. Let's go. Yeah. So <laughs> this is um, it's this back in like the eight, late eighties or early nineties, and I was spending a summer working at the Ronald McDonald uh, camp for kids with cancer. Right. So this is a tough situation. A lot of little bald kids have cancer, and they get a couple of weeks off from 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 hospital sort of situation. And we hear that the um, the uh, PJs from Long Island are going to fly in on a jolly green giant. They're going to land and just be just awesome. So these guys land in this cool helicopter. All the kids are gathered around, and it's freaking amazing. And they get out. They all look like the right stuff out of the movie. The wind's blowing their hair. It's pretty. They all look like male models except for the chief. It looks like he's still been fighting since World War II, right? So these been. guys roll yeah, up, that's why. right? He's He's still doing stuff in New York. They just got back from the deli. They were on a deli run. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Them, them New York boys do early in the morning. You get in, you PT, deli run, then you start work. Everybody knows that. <laughs> so these these guys get out, and they're like, we're going to show you how we do infill, infiltration into a water-based environment. All the kids are like, this is amazing. And the chief, this old grizzled guy is going to stand and explain to the kids. All, everybody else gets gets into the helicopter, flies away. And they come roaring in, roaring in really low over the trees. And then they basically bank. So the, the helicopter is almost pointing, you know, up, up into the sky. The back opens and all the guys fall out into the water. And then the thing takes off, right? And this 12-year-old cancer kid turns to the chief and goes, seriously, that was your plan? And all the kids were like, really? That looks like kind of like a Bugs Bunny kind of a situation. You guys put a lot of thought into that? And these 12 – the Chiefs like, wait a second. We've actually – this is actually really good. And these 12-year-olds just start hammering this poor guy. It was awesome. I was crying laughing. Seriously, that yeah, was what do, you, what do you do? And what do you do with that? You can't – you can't knife head. What do you – you know. What are, yeah, you got you to gotta fight that kid. But, yeah. like, again, he's a cancer patient. He's all the other 12-year-old totally kids, all the other 12-year-old kids were like, let us come up with a plan. I definitely think we can come up with something better than that. Just absolutely roasting a 30-year yeah. special operator. Just crushing him. Tech. And he was, like, he was turning red. He was like, listen, kid. <laughs> listen up, you little shit. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. I, I want to dig into the communication stuff because when, yeah. when I was instructing, I would hit my, you know, w one thing that I always was worried about, and this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but welcome to the podcast. This yeah. is what I do on, on the podcast. Um, when I was an instructor, people would, I would fight burnout, right? So we, yeah. we changed the minimum instructional, uh, you know, bill to pay essentially from four years to three years while I was there. It's a big deal. You can always extend and go further, but we found that, you know, it was a, a bigger incentive to guys like, hey, you're not going to be there for four years. You're going to yeah. go do your time and then come back to the to the teams, so to speak, and, and you'll just go on with your life. But I was always worried about burnout, right? You know, yep. short story. Um, and I, I got to a point where I was explaining to guys and gals that were working there. They're like, yeah, the, the biggest problem is it's Groundhog Day. Dude, yep. it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. And, and you know, the guys and, and girls that I would supervise, they would say, hey, I'm getting sick of repeating myself. Yep. You know, it feels like I'm just saying the same stuff over and over again. They're just not getting it. And then it turns into, man, these students aren't getting it. This team is the worst team and whatever else. And I'm like, hey, hold on. You've said this, a, you know, a hundred times. You're right. But you've never said it to these people. You've never had this team. Like, yes, teams make the same mistakes, right? Teams forget gear somewhere. Teams don't have accountability. Teams don't tape their gear correctly. Like there are all these things that the teams do that we're like, yeah, we got you. You do it the same, but it's not the same person. You're That's not right. like, you're not wasting your time. Um, whatever. How do you, how do you train instructors to know that the things that they're doing, especially on a repetitive basis like that, how do you get them to see the value in each interaction? So um, I'm going to tell you another weird story. So it, it, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get your answer tangentially, just like you did. So okay. I'm down with the Pittsburgh Pirates and they've asked me to come down to help them with some of their coaching stuff. I know nothing about sports. Right. So I'm like, OK, but I know nothing about sports. So I'll make you a trade. I'll come down and do my best. But then I get to interview some of your gray beard coaches and they're like, OK. So I find the most curmudgeonly guy that's been doing it for 150 years since baseball started, right? And he's over it, probably drinks whiskey in the morning with his coffee kind of a situation. Sure. So, um, but he's he's like a legend. So he meets me and he goes, I understand you want to ask me some questions about uh, uh, batting. And I'm like, yeah, man. He's like, come on to the batter's cage. And then he goes, hey, Simmons, come with us. Simmons, I'm making that name up, but it's like they're professional pitcher. So they go to the, they go to the pitching mound. 
he puts me in the batting cage and I'm like, Hey, before we, just so you understand, I have <laughs> held a bat since I was 12 years old. He's like, shut up. It's I like, don't okay. watch sports ball, my dude. Like, yeah. I don't care about this at all. Like, yeah. this is not my thing. Yeah. And, and he goes, don't care. He goes, get in the thing. And he's like, show me a swing. And I was like, but I was like, he's like, stop talking. Show me your swing. I'm like, okay. So he's like, drop your hips a little bit. Loosen your shoulders up. Relax. Bring it up a little bit. He does a couple of these little things. Okay. And then he says, now listen to me. I'm going to yell out to Simmons. And Simmons is going to go slowly back like his pitcher. And when he goes slowly back, you go slowly back. When he goes forward, you go forward. I don't want you to think about baseball. I don't want you to think about the ball. I want you to think about this like a dance. I want you to dance. This is like an old gray beard guy. He's like, I want you to dance with a pitcher. He goes back, you go back. He goes forward, you go forward. We're going to do that for a little bit. I was like, okay, this sounds weird. That guy sent to me 15 balls. I hit 12 of them. Now, granted, he's throwing to my bat. But remember, I haven't touched a bat in 40 years. And there is a certain genius that only comes through a lot of reps. There's only a genius. That guy doesn't get there because he figured that out. He got it because he stared at thousands of people and he finally figured out some hacks. And so what I say to instructors that are saying to me, I say, look, instruction by and large is pretty boring. Just know that people list, watch more than they listen. So they're watching your body language and what you're doing more than they're listening to what you say. And three, it's a kind of Zen. It's kind of martial arts. It's kind of this thing where you only get better at reps. So you have to stop thinking about it like a beginning and an end. You have to think about it in terms of craftsmanship. Like I want to be greatest woodworker or, or the greatest silversmith or the greatest shooter in the world. It's the same thing. You just got to do reps. So that's my weird answer. No, no it, I, it, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So I was, I was going to equate what you just said to, yeah. to something that we have been trying to get after, like in the weapon school. So you've got all, you know, we just talked about the air force has, you know, yeah. their, their technology, their thing. Right. And we spend a bunch of monies on planes, which is great. Cause we need we need kick ass planes. Of course we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we need we in, we need high end training. You know, so we've we've got all these named exercises that we do that are different levels. You know, you have got your entry level, your mid level, and then your your four hundred series. You know, of, yep. of doctorates level exercises. And one of the things when we're as we're starting to enter or not starting to enter, we have been in a fiscally constrained kind of environment, resource environment, right? And you know, some of these exercises that we do cost an enormous amount of money. Like sure. I, I don't even like it would blow people's mind. The amount like of Operation money Red Wings or, or something like that. Yeah, <clears throat> right. And now that simulation is getting to a point where oh, yeah. we can we can connect everybody together. We can have high end training. We can have physics based um physics based simulators, meaning it's not a guy on the other end going like, okay, well, this missile can go to 40 miles. And you know, it's, it's, Hey, physics wise, we have the data. You can't adjust it. That's what's going to happen. You know, and, and, and the way the planes flies are all physics based instead of just kind of a computer gaming. And we can do that now, or we're, and we're getting to that point where it's getting better, where we can just do you know, we can have pilots and I'll just use pilots in this case. We can have them show up. They do an hour long mission brief, you know, mission planning. Here's, here's your situation. Here's what we're going to do. And they could run simulator for, for 45 minutes or just over and over and over again, quick yep. debrief for 45 minutes, then run it another 10 times debrief real quick. And then they can do that for a week and they get more reps in that week than they would doing three months of flying yep with with high-end missiles that are you know in the simulator actually shooting at them versus just kind of a you know they've got a a, a guy flying behind them as a opposing force saying okay hey i gunned you on that one yep you know it's just it, the repetition is so important at this point now that we're getting to a point where we're potentially going to find ourselves in a high-end fight here real soon yep you guys are familiar with the alt report that's no. that it started top gun and then okay. led to operation red wings that's where it came from i'll check it out alt a uh i can send it to you it's uh a u l t um but basically i'm going to mess up the numbers but you can look it up so uh the real the quick story here and this really matters to what you're saying is that in the vietnam war after korea um 
in Korea, the um, the Navy uh, kill rate or the Navy and Air Force kill rate in Korea was about three to one. No, sorry, seven to one. Um, seven enemy shot down for every American. By Vietnam, that had dropped to three to one. And the reason was all the World War II vets had retired. They would fought through Korea and then retired, and it was all new pilots. And so this guy named Frank Alt, he's a Navy guy, gets hired. I think he's Navy. No, he's Air Force guy. Sorry, he, he worked in, in Nellis. Um, he was the director of, of uh, academics there. Um, so um, he basically writes this report. And he says, hey, guys, the reason that you're having this problem is that the first time these guys are ever in combat is combat. So we need to create a realistic training environment beforehand. The Air Force, however, says, now we're not doing that. We've met humans. We don't like them. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy our way out of it. So better radar, better missiles, that sort of thing. When they get back, it's one of the few times in history where two organizations facing the same problem came back with their solutions at the same time. So it's like 1971 or something. Um, I'm, I'm, these numbers are rough. I can get you the right ones. But basically, um, the the Navy goes something like 31 to 1, and the Air Force goes 0.89 to 1. Oof. And so that's where they create Operation Red Wings, is to give them physical training. So the I'm going to pause there and add one more thing. There's a lot of data in sports to show that there are people that perform really well in uh, practice and suck at performance. It's one of the things they cannot figure out. And this is a long-winded way to say that simulations are extraordinary for all the things they can do for reps to give hand-eye coordination, all these things. There is still a cognitive dissonance between practice and play. And so you actually still need to do the physical exercises or you're going to have the stutter step cognitive dissonance actually in combat, which you don't want. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's not me making an argument that we've got to do sure. away with Lifeline or something like that. But there it's are like, people that are making that argument. There, there are, which is, it's nuts because just because I can run a, a, a scenario to get the yep. reputation 60 times in, in, in a week doesn't make up for the fact that I take off from Nellis. I've got to plan my fuel. I've got to plan not to hit people. I've got to deal with air traffic control sensors along the way. I've got to then fly over the water. I've got to air refuel. Then I've got to continue to to, to go on. I need to start looking for alternate locations to, to land. You know, all that those other kind of what would seemingly be admin pieces yeah. are some of the things that kill people before those missiles. 100%. So you have to have that portion too. Like it's, we've got yeah. to find a nice blend Absolutely. Uh, of, of making that work. We always talk to guys at the shoot house. Like when I go, I go all over the world and uh, I always say, do you ever run a, you ever run a scenario where the answer is don't go in. And they're like, well, no, that we don't have these shoot houses very long. They're hard to schedule. And I'm like, okay, but just so you know, sometimes the actual answer is don't go in. Yeah. We found that out. Yeah. Call outs. Yeah. <laughs> Now you, well, you, we, we used to, we used to do a, there was a leadership exercise for the crows that we used to do. And it was just a complete reindeer game, whatever you want to call it. We would pretend like we're giving them a mission, yeah. but it's a mission that none of it. We came up with a mission that was right on that borderline where every single instructor, and it had to be unanimous because it yeah. was the only way that it worked. Every single instructor was like, no, I would not accept the risk on that mission. There was yeah. some piece of it that we built in where, yeah. you know, it wasn't huge. But it was enough for like a, a team leader worth his salt or a, an officer on the team yep. would go, hey, guys, now something about this has to change because we can't do this as briefed. Yep. But we would we would make the 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 crow tell us, no, the student. Yeah. And it was the hardest thing. It would, it would screw them up every time they were like, well, if we if we could do this, we would just be like, no, this is a no. And they would be like, no, no, I think I could do it. And we're like, well, it's unanimous. Every operator that you're looking at. Yeah, said no to this problem. Like we yeah. built it on purpose, like that, and it was actually it was so super valuable. Super to valuable. Watch them work through it, and then because yeah. they think they're, you know, the students think they're going to get contact every yeah. time they leave. Yeah. Every time they jump is going to be, you know, yep. something. Every time that they go into the shoot house, they're going to go shoot something, and that's yes. not the way it is. So, uh, Preston, you you actually have a, a good take on callouts. Yeah. Okay. Can you mind going into that real quick? Sure. So. um I've, I've written about this in my dissertation, but it's not wildly known. And, and I probably would never get into the actual data, but I'll give you some rough numbers. I won't even give you rough numbers. I'll give you the context. So there is, there in, in, the la in our lifetime, there is one defining moment, and that's 9-11. And generationally, 
even more than the post-COVID generation, the pre-9-11 generation and post-9-11 generation were the most diverse split in military special operations in our lifetime and, and many others. And so what was happening overseas in 2003 and four and five was the Israelis had let the teams know that rushing into a house to do rapid you know, hostage rescue or hasty or whatever you want to call it, it was dangerous because the bad guys had seen the movies too. And a lot of guys were dying going in the fatal funnel. And the Israelis were like, dude, what are you doing? You guys own the sky. You own the land. Just surround the building and call them out. Except all the teams were like, nah, that's cowardly. We wouldn't do that. We, I don't know. If we're Americans. Like we invented this. You guys can shut up. What do you Israelis know? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what was interesting was it wasn't a strategic problem. It was a cultural problem, right? culture eat strategy for lunch. And what happened was you could actually run a graph from about 2003 to about 2011 showing how many people, it, how many people had to die, how many people had to bury their friends before each team in SOCOM, JSOC and the five eyes adopted callouts. And you could actually measure it. It's, it had everything to do with culture and nothing to do with strategy or tactics. Oh, well, culture and ego. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, <clears throat> there's different ways to learn, right? There's, yeah. there's, there's the hard way and yeah. then there's, there's the other way. Yeah. And un unfortunately, or whatever, like our culture tends to lean into the, the harder way 100%. because of, because of what the way that we are. Yeah. It, it's just like the Aaron scenario, you know, like it, we, we tell the students and, and the culture is like, we can do this no matter what, like we're all Jason Bourne. Yeah. Yes. Is always an option. And then when you come up against it, it's really hard to, to find the other side of your brain to be like, Nah, we're just gonna we're just gonna get on a loudspeaker and let them know that we're here, and and you better come out, or otherwise we're gonna you know drop a bomb on your building. Yeah, well, well we you know we talk about the JBs, right? Jack Bauer, Jason Bourne, James Bond, the JBs, right? We talk about the JBs <laughs> and the fact that like everybody wants to be a JB, and the need to be a JD sometimes uh, obscures your ability to, to think logically. Like, why don't we just open the see if the door's unlocked? Like before we see, bring the building down, or like you know right. what I mean? Is the door unlocked? Is anyone checked? Well, there's a that's a uh, the old axiom when we're doing you know technical rescue when we're trying to access a patient. There's a there's a joke. It's try before you pry. Yeah. Did you just try to open the door before yeah. you're like you're taking out the you 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 have these tools and you want yeah. to use these tools and all this stuff that you have and it turns out the best thing that you could possibly do is just just try to open the door. Yeah, that's out. right. Yeah. Well, you know, and we saw the the reverberations that, you know, speaking specifically on the call outs, we yeah. saw that change during our career. Oh, yeah. Like when I first started doing CQC way back in the day, I mean, it yeah. was like, you know, we were doing like Rolling Thunder, like yeah. we were like Hall Boss and we were doing all this yeah. other weird stuff. I think I can say that stuff because it's so old now. But I mean, we were doing things that it was changing mid flow. Yeah. Like as we were going, they were like, OK, hey, you guys can do it the fast way like we we used to do it, but nobody's really doing that anymore everybody's doing this really slow, deliberate clearance. Yeah, yeah. Like you're not going into rooms that you don't have to, cause they might be booby trapped. We're not yeah, even 100%. going into the house if we don't need to. That's right. Um, and, and I'll tell you what, like, you know, I, I heard uh, the Navy tier one team leader talk about going into, they had the entrenched machine gun at the end of the hallway yep. that killed two dudes. But I yep. heard him, he was on, that, that was his team. And he told that story. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, man. Like, Are you able to say his name? Deal uh yeah, you don't have to probably leave it alone. not yeah leave it alone it's all right yeah yep i'm trying to think what he goes but it's like i think his go by is like i can say that it's like uh, ozzy his okay. go by is oz but yep anyway all good <laughs> but that's yeah. the uh that's the level of competence right when you can you can reach a level of flexibility because in my mind competence and flexibility and experience all kind of come together like to, to, to make it a flexible thing. So you can see those other options. So you're not just a robotically walking up to the door and placing your charge without checking first, right? And I think that's where we want to talk about the NCO core a little bit and your take on this, uh, Preston, yep. is that experience, I think, lies in those dudes with the, the repetition and the experience to be able to see beyond the training scenarios and to, to, to make things you know flexible and, and make sense uh, uh, beyond just the, we've been tasked with A, therefore we're going to do B. So a couple of things, and I've I've got to actually to be to be fair and just, I got to play both sides of this, right? And so I'm going to start with the negative, and then I'm going to go to the positive. Well, I'll start by saying this: uh, ninety percent of the times I'm brought to teams, I'm brought by either warrant officers or NCOs. The officers don't really get involved because it's the warrants and the NCOs that are doing the training and the education. So that's where I spend most of my time. You should also know that 
when I took a tour internationally and went to all the five eyes around the world to their, I was working with all their selections, just having one year where I hit every single team. And I, and I knew I was doing this tour. And so I decided to ask a series of questions. And one of the questions I asked was in a 20 year career is the last five years of an NCO, an NCO's career, last five years of 20, a net gain or a net loss for the teams. And what do you think the universal answer was? Net win. <laughs> it was net loss with an asterisk. Net loss, except for the one or two guys that are carrying the whole team. So you end up with this bifurcation in about 15 years. You get the tribal elders that are treasured and honored. And then you get a bunch of dinosaurs that are making things worse, not doing their jobs. They're, they're brick walls in, in terms of innovation. They're clinging to legacy, a lot of these other things. And so what I would say is, the NCOs are so, so critical to the functioning of a fast moving team and that we are not working hard enough to do job creation for their full career. We are often, we're often milking them for five or 10 years, breaking them and then shoving them aside while they're still in service. And I think what SOCOM should do, because they're such an, uh, like, I can't emphasize enough how critical they are to the success of small fluid teams we have to be much more intentional about their time left in the rain, and we have much more intentional about what happens afterwards. And so in a perfect world, right, like one of the arguments that's being made by us and others is that NCOs now need the same level of educational knowledge that officers need in order to go after rapidly emerging complex adaptive problem sets. So what that means, though, is that what we can do is that we can run them hard for a few years, break them out, let them go to school, put them back into the training command so they can start demonstrating some of that and then come back either into recruitment or into leadership, higher leadership, so that there's a progression both physically and intellectually, as opposed to just leaving me in the woods for 20 years. Yeah, uh, you would, you would uh, call it Cult officers get cultivated and enlisted or NCOs get extracted. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. So cultivation versus extraction. So this is a, this is a model that's really, um, it's controversial, but we put it forward. And basically there's two models of human development. There's this, is, I'm, I'm really broad brushing it here. Um, so I'm, I'm making some generalizations for the point of, of illustration. But there's one model in which we take a human and we cultivate them throughout their career so that we make them both better for us, but better for the country. There's another model where we cultivate them intensely for a short period of time, two, three, four years, and then we extract all of that knowledge as long as we can before we break them. And then we're like, and then we're like disposable, like, okay, you're good. And too often we're treating NCOs as disposable when they're actually a national asset. And so what we need to do is start cultivating them. But but I'll say this before we go blaming the institution and the culture and the and the officers, you should know that some of my biggest pushback against these ideas comes from NCOs. Oh, I don't doubt that. Yeah. I don't doubt when that you, one. You're talking about it and you're like, you got to get them out of the field. I'm like, there are some guys that are gonna fight you to the really death hard on that's, that. That's why I'm an NCO. I yeah. didn't want to come out of the field. That's right. If I wanted to come out of the field, I would have been an officer. That's right. Except that we actually know what that looks like 15 or 20 years in. And that's the part that the NCOs don't know that I, after 15 or 20 years, you know, let me put it this way, just to put a, just to put a really clear point on this. MCT, Mission Critical Team Institute, was founded in 2016, incubated at the Wharton School for three years, independent in 2018. It's now 2024. So that's eight years we're in business. I have been to, a, I've buried one of my friends every year of those eight years in fire and special operations and medicine, right? This, the life cycle on you guys isn't fucking awesome. And unless we're going to start to have honest conversations about the long term impact of the hard life, then we're going to continue to bury our friends. And I'm quite, I'm over it. Like I've done my time so I can just be real frank about it. My job isn't to create short-term wins. My job is to create amazing people that can go on to be grandfathers. But that means things, some things are going to have to change. Yeah, some of this is uh, – some of it's it's hard though, right? Like because we are talking about like the institution and, and, and how as a like an NCO and a senior NCO later on in your career you can provide value yeah. or how you're allowed to provide value. Like 
this is, you know, my personal experience is at the end of my career, Yeah, you know, you walk into these offices where like, you're still seen as just a, a, you know, a ground pounder bearded, you know, Neanderthal. Yep. And you're like, Hey, I have this many years training folks. Yeah. And these are the solutions that I've seen, <clears throat> but the, the, the O core, and it's not really their fault, I guess. They're not really designed to like accept your solutions and to implement them or to like take that into account because you're just a senior and CEO. You're like, you're not on team anymore. Like we always talk about as a, as an E6, I had way more power to affect change yeah. oh, at the yeah. ground level than I did as an E8. So can I just, can I just push to some examples? CZ Lopez, right? Colin Lopez, right? Greg Smith, right? Both of them from your organization, I believe, right? Both of them had massive influence on the on the entire way special operations are run. Massive influence. But it meant not going from, this is my experience, this is how you do it, boss, but instead going in and being like, tell me what your cool ideas are. Let me help translate that into what actually will fucking happen. And let's actually go for a fact here. So let me partner with you. So Trina, I would only argue that I think people are sometimes unsuccessful because they're used to using the methodologies they used as a young NCO and try to do that with officers and it won't work. But if you, if you're willing to flex and speak their language, you can accomplish cool things. Yeah. I've seen them both ways, I guess. Yeah. I just kidding. I should have just been like, you're right. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> one of those I'm, feels I'm like just an optimist. With an officer, though, so. <laughs> what? I, you know, you, one of them feels like working with an officer though. And that's the part that I don't like. So how do we force them to do what we want right. without actually having to acknowledge that they're people? Yeah. Yeah. Let me know how that works out, Aaron. Just okay. like, give me, give me right. some, well, uh, let me tell you from 22 years, it hasn't gone well. Yeah. No, okay. really shocking. Okay. Shocking. <laughs> shocking. Figure you guys can just shut up and do what I tell you it has never yeah, once that worked one in your little me. book doc. I got some numbers messing up your means and your averages and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> never once worked. <laughs> Not what we say, time. what we say to everyone is, if you have a problem and you have a solution, you have to solve for one up and one down. Meaning if you got the good idea, Ferry, if you're not solving for the guy who's going to write the check and you're not solving for the guy that's actually going to implement, you're not, you're wasting everyone's time. If you're only solving for your problem, go away. Yeah, for sure. No, and it, it, to your point, like we, we always say like, Hey, if you, if you're an instructor and the, the students aren't picking up what you're putting down, yeah. is that their fault or your fault? Right. And it's hard yeah. to turn that lens back around on me and be like, no, no, it's my fault. If, I'm trying to affect change yeah, and it's not being received properly or it it's some, my fault. Here's I don't have a real hard yeah. time letting go of that. I don't know why. Yeah. Here's one thing that people do not want to hear, but I say all the time um, there's this old expression that if soldiers aren't complaining, they're not happy. Right. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the problem, here's the problem C publicly complaining. What that is, is a statement that you're a victim. It's a statement that you can't solve for that problem. Meaning that if you're a leader, even an NCO leader, and you're whining in public, what you're saying to your subordinates is, I'm a little bit hopeless, helpless. And so that's not a good message. If you're going to whine, do it with your peers. Never, ever do it with people that are below you or above you. Because all you're projecting is, I can't do anything to influence my own destiny. Oh, 100%. They, it always goes up peers or up. It yeah. never goes down. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> ever. And I've watched people do that. And I'm like, I don't know what you think your plan was, but you just took away all your credibility. Yeah. And, and the, the, the other side of that, I guess, is if, if you are, you know, at the top, you're a team sergeant or something like that, you're that senior NCO and you don't hear the, the complaining or the, the gripes from, from the, the junior NCOs and the junior enlisted, that means you are no longer, they, they no longer trust you. It's not yeah, because right. they're happy and everything yes. like that. It's because you are no longer in the trust tree. You, yeah. you have betrayed them yeah. and, and they, they either, it's either maybe that you've betrayed them or they just is like, ah, he's, he's checked out. He's, he's not going yeah. to do anything about it anyway. What's the point? Yeah. Now as an cut outsider, off. as an outsider to visiting <laughs> teams, when I see that happening, it's devastating. Like when I watch a leader, whether it be an NCO or officer, cross that Rubicon where they do something where that tri the tribe says, no, that was, you can't do that. That's one of the things you actually can't do. And so now you're written off. It's very hard to get back on the bus. Oh yeah. That's why, that's why the, the fundamental, um, the fundamental uh, characteristic across all of, all of special operations is yeah. trust.
Like yeah. it, it, you cannot go any farther. Cause if I can't trust you, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything with you. I'm not even going to yeah. talk to you. Cause it, it, there's a, there's an old guy named DT who's a, like a legend back was like battle of Mogadishu kind of situation. And he says, here's, here's the thing, Preston, what past performance does is it builds trust. And what trust does is give you freedom to maneuver. And in soft, your one currency is freedom to maneuver. If you can do that. A lot of things can get done without that. You can't do anything. Well, I think it's hard sometimes for people in those leadership roles too, because like the team will solve a problem no matter what. Like if they bring the the the, the problem to you and the solutions, and you ignore them long enough, they will solve it. And I think one of those things is like I I'm not immune from this. Like there's times when I've been like, no, you can't do that. The problem gets solved, and to to be flexible enough and to be you know humble enough to look at your younger folks and be like, you were right in this situation, and I was yeah. wrong, is a really difficult thing to do after you know you have like 18 years and you're so and so and people are blowing smoke up your butt all the time about how great you are oh yeah um to to, to look back and be like no 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 i was i was the problem in that situation you guys yes. solved it anyway and good on you yep yeah 100 <laughs> percent. what are, what are we talking about here trent you, you care to share a lot of hurt like, behind yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there was some feel it's, 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 it's like my entire you know like everything like that right like uh it's it's being an instructor and learning these lessons over time like you're gonna make mistakes in front of your students you're gonna mess things up like when when preston was talking about like the amount of reps it takes to become a good instructor all i can think of in my head is how many people's pipeline experience i negatively affected before i figured certain things out you know before i, I got the mm. knowledge and the reps to do things the right way to find those little you know wickets to 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 make people do what i want them to do in the correct way so um you know and as a senior and it's the same way you're gonna make mistakes it's just harder because you're older and and you have more experience you're getting paid more uh to to hold on to that humility and be able to look back and be like i was the i was the problem here like as an instructor i was the problem in certain situations i was holding the team back i wasn't letting them you know do what they need to do or i gave the wrong instructions so that that's a huge problem i think as as you know, an officer or senior NCO moving up, moving forward. Well, and the crazy part about that is you probably, as an instructor, as a line instructor, you probably saw 4,000, 4,000 airmen that came through. Lots of airmen. Yeah. I mean, that's so, nuts. Like that, that gray beard baseball guy, like how many, how many folks could he, like, I'm sure at night he thinks about it. He's like, I could have, I probably had one of the best hitters ever in my, in my, you know, little group of guys that I just didn't develop the correct way. And, it, and it's difficult. So that's one of those things is letting go of the past and, and maintaining your humility and, and being able to move the entire organization forward and seeing the big picture. And I think that's another big thing is as you move forward, if you're not seeing the big picture, you're not you're not making the right decisions. I would agree with all that. I would also say, though, in fairness, um, none of the militaries, none of the departments do a great job of developing their instructor cadre at the SOCOM level. And so sometimes when you, in hindsight, look back and say, man, I really dropped the ball there. Remember, that wasn't your, no one gave you that skill set. You were figuring out on your own. And while you're smart and you all have feral intelligence, right? You figured out on your own. There's some stuff where you actually need some help. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, what other projects do you guys have going on? I, I think you guys have a podcast as well, the TeamCast, right? That's right. We have the yeah MCTI Teamcast where we basically interview neuroscientists and educators, and Trey's been on there, and astronauts have been on there, and and it's basically looking at when we look at all of our teams across urban fire, wildland fire, tech law enforcement, special operations, NASA, medicine. What are what what are the things that might help instructor cadres do better on Monday? And so that's what we're that's what we're worried interested about. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I know. And I know you guys have, uh, have already had, I think at least twice, maybe I, I know once, uh, had our favorite person, Trey free on. So, oh yeah. 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 Trey's and Trey, Trey and I go back a long time. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> the man is a treasure. Again, like, yeah, he is a national treasure. He is. A treasure. Yeah. I, I agree yeah. with that. Um, so hold on a second. I'm taking notes here. No worries. What, what kind of lessons learned do you have uh, kind of putting you on the spot here sure. from, from all your years of, of working with our communities, what kind of lessons learned do you have that you would like to share kind of with the group, uh, the, the audience that we have that are looking to join special operations? So, you know, what's really interesting is that um, 
if you step back from all the data and you look for some of the commonality around the teams about what they're selecting for, right? A couple of things they're selecting for is what we call weaponized curiosity. So you've taken your natural curiosity and you've weaponized it. So you're just constantly, well, why is that? Well, why is that? Why is that? You're just constantly never ending doing that. One of the things that I just see that destroys those same people later in their career is for whatever reason, they let that weaponized curiosity go away and they become very fixed in their mindset. The world becomes very binary, good and bad. And so what I would just say is, you know, we've written this article called Residue. And if you haven't seen it, I would just type in MCTI Residue and take a look at it. And basically what we find is we ask this question, instead of having to, how to fix broken operators, how do we actually make great long-term operators? And one of the things we found was, you know, from a strength-based point of view, after you're about two years in, first two years, you need to be head down just learning your job. But after that, you need what's called a third thing. You need, if you, what we found is if you just have family and just have work, if you lose one, you're likely to lose the other, right? And also it makes you really boring. If you just have those two things, you're, you become an incredibly boring person. So you need to join a rock band or a rugby league or a woodworking or something where you're learning and being a beginner again all the time, where you're breaking stuff and you suck sometimes. And if you do that, it's both basically really good for your neuroplasticity, which will prevent things like Alzheimer's later on, but it also makes you a nicer human. You don't become that curmudgeonly jerk at the bar, right? That's complaining about how the world doesn't treat you right. Um, and so I would really say that. And the other thing that happens is every team in the world, we would never be able to quantify this, selects for sense of humor. You've got to have the ability to not take yourself too seriously, right? Whether whatever team, whatever selection you're doing, whether it's a long, long walk or a long abuse, it, you have to have a sense of humor, right? You have to have this idea like when things are really bad and then it starts raining, you got to turn to your buddy and go, oh, good, it's raining. I was hoping we'd get the full trifecta, but they'll laugh. You would all laugh in that situation, right? Like, even though you were broken, tired, never, it was, you haven't slept in three days. Those are the kind of humor, right? That binds everyone and brings everybody together. So you need those two things, but you need them throughout your whole career. So if you lose your curiosity and you lose your humor, man, the, the, the runway does not look good for you. Well, I think that's why so many people have, have found comfort, I guess, or, or discomfort in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah. I think that's why that is taken off because yeah. you get humbled every single day. That's right. Every and, and you're starting from scratch. And I mean, you do see a lot of, of middle-aged dudes yeah. uh, and women just yeah. jumping in that. They're like, all right, well, this is something new. I need something. I mean, 100%. Aaron, you, you, you go all the time. How, what is it? What, what, do you, what would you say the, the ratio is in terms of, you know, at least middle age? Dude, it's growing. It's growing a lot. Like, you know, if you think they think that they're going to get to about 5% of the American population that does BJJ yep. as a hobby, like, and again, that doesn't sound like a lot, but there are 330 million, uh, million Americans. So when you start talking about, you know, 5% of the American population doing something, it's pretty big, but uh, it's been growing a lot, especially the last 10 years, man. Like you look around and there's a ton of people that just decide at 30, 35 to be like, no, I'm looking for something new. It's essentially it's human chess with dire physical consequences yep. that you're playing. Um, you know, it's good cardio. It's a good workout. So it's there. And if you do it right, you, I mean, there's injuries and everything, but if you do it right, you really don't get injured. Like as a hobbyist jujitsu player, you're not going to get, you know, you're not training to go to ADCC. You're not Gordon Ryan. You're just there to do it. So yeah, yeah it's, it's surprising to see a lot of people get into it and it helps a ton of people. And you see the same thing every single time the spazzy white belt addicted guy that goes 15 times a week for the first two years. He does it is definitely Just a thing addicted. for a reason because <laughs> people connect with it, brother. And then they're saying, Oh, and wearing their hair in a man bun. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Weird stuff happens, bro. Weird stuff happens. And I would also say to people who are listening is, you know, a lot of guys that we work with physically have been broken over the years or they're aging out of some of the more kinesthetic kinds of things like BJJ. And so to, to, it doesn't have to be that it could be Tai Chi. It could be cycling. It could be something where you're doing it with a group of people, but you're doing it regularly and you have to learn and you can suck at it. So it's, I think BJJ is amazing for that. I just think you're not going to be able to do it probably when you're 70 or 80. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you yeah, have to start we, a podcast. Yeah, you know, yeah. Share your share your opinions in public and see how that works out for you. That's yeah. a good humility builder right there. Not with that attitude. You yeah, can roll that. if you're you can roll if you're eighty if you're super hard like woodpecker lips. What's up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, it's funny, uh, Preston, while you were saying that, talking about learning new things, I was sitting here going, man, how about starting a podcast? Because everybody thinks that you just, you know, flip on oh. a camera and a computer. And it's just, no, there's yeah. so much more to it. A lot more to it. <laughs> so much more. more to it. So, yeah, awesome. Well, um, last thing that we usually do with our guests yeah. is kind of ask them for advice. So, like we, we had talked about, our, our demographic is kind of your 15 to 30-year-olds that are looking to yeah. join Air Force Special Warfare or Special Operations. Um, some are in the private sector and, and not looking to join. But yep. what kind of advice, um, you know, whether it's one piece, one piece of advice or five pieces, uh, would you give to those folks? So, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we talk about is – for those of you who are listening or thinking about going into the pipeline um, and selecting for a SOCOM team, just know this, you're doing it because there's something calling to you. There's some need that's not getting met in the, what we call the ordinary world. So if you decide to step into the extraordinary world, what anthropologists call it the extraordinary world, what you're doing intentionally is taking the hard path. It doesn't mean you're going to be successful the first time, but it means that something in you says that you'll be happier on the hard path than you are on the easy path. But if you decide to take that path, if you decide to become a surgeon or PJ or combat controller or a Navy SEAL or whatever, if you choose that path, you have to take entire responsibility for the entirety of that choice. That means that when you have the extreme experience where somebody else's blood is on your boots, and you're still you're still clothed when you wake up the next day and you're wondering how you're going to do this. It's not just about the physical aches and pains. It's also about making meaning of extreme experiences that come with the hard path. I'm not talking about going to a psychologist. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm saying that if you choose this path, hard days will come. Hard days. When me and my friends talk about that was a hard day, we're not talking about dropping our ice cream cone. We're talking about burying a friend or doing some bad things. And so when those things happen, that's not, you were never built to deal with that, right? You were never built to deal with a kid that's broken or a, a, a woman who gets shot or your friend who dies next to you. There's no school for that. The only way to make meaning of that is to gather the people around you that were there would understand and just tell the story. And then from there, you might need other stuff. But right then, being honest about the fact that when you take the hard path and go to the extraordinary world, you better take responsibility for making meaning of those experiences because no one's coming to rescue you. You now become the rescuer. So if you're not prepared to get involved and in looking after yourself and your friends, you're going to die a short and ugly life. That's the hard news there. That's my it's advice. Truth. Yeah. I like it. I'm here yeah. for it. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, Preston, appreciate you joining us. Everybody out there, go check out Mission Critical Team Institute and go check out the MCTI podcast or Teamcast. Um, and it's everywhere. I, like I just looked it up. It's everywhere on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, yep. the some of the other players as well. There's a bunch of them. I mean, I, who's using not using Spotify or Apple Podcasts? I, I don't know, but whatever. Um, Somebody in Lithuania. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure well appreciate you joining us looking forward to having you back out uh nellis whenever that is i don't i don't yeah. take a look at the schedule but uh and then for everybody else out there please uh check us out at onesready.com get yourself a shirt flag whatever it is and then uh if you happen to feel so inclined to leave us a review go for it all right we're out here Later.